Please turn to Acts 13 and have that ready. That will be where our study comes from today. I have some slides that will just be cycling through over the next few weeks as we look at some of the travels of Paul. There will be a few maps interspersed with a few pictures of some of the actual places. And you can pay attention to them if that's something you like to do. You, it can distract you from having to look at my face, which is tough for over 40 minutes or under 40 minutes. And uh, they'll just be cycling through without a whole lot of commentary. But I think it's helpful to understand and try to grasp a bit of the concept when we talk about going to certain places. Some of you are uh, more interested in, in history or archaeology or maps even. And some of you can care less, and that's uh, just fine. I, I went into a class my sophomore year at UC Davis and there was an, an older gentleman who was barely taller than this table and I walk into class and he said welcome to my tour of the ancient cities each day you come into this class I will take you on a journey to a different ancient city you will leave this class saying to your fellow students, I have been to Rome. I have been to Constantinople. I leaned back in my chair, a jaded college student, and looked at the person next to me. I said, yeah, right. Three weeks later, I was, wow, I was in London today. That was awesome. Turned out the guy had written the textbook two textbooks, two volumes, and all he did, retired, was teach that class, and all of the slides in class were his personal slides because what he did as a retired college professor was lead tours through the ancient world now today, and so they were all like, this is out of my hotel room in Venice. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. And he wrote the book, he'd been there, and he told the story every day he was in class. Now, my problem is I didn't write the book and I haven't been there, and I'm taller than this table. So there's a lot of things I don't have going for me that make me like that particular college professor. But one of the things that helped me do from my background in history is that if you want to connect with a story, I think it's important to understand where the ancient story took place a bit about the cultural setting so that we can get excited about the message when it comes to the Word of God. And I think it's important for us as we study God's Word, whether it's collectively here together or on our own, to ask questions like, how was this received initially? Why would Paul have said this? What did it look like where Paul and Barnabas were traveling? And we may not know the answers to all those questions, but in asking them, we're putting ourselves in the original context so that we can better receive the original message. We're looking, as Chris encouraged us, at the starting point of the church in Antioch. Now, last week, if you'll notice at the end of chapter 12, it said, but the word of God increased and multiplied. And this was as a result of the death of Herod. We see as the word of God begins to grow to the outermost parts of Judea, and this is now Caesarea Philippi, Philippi, where there is conflict between the word of God and those who would oppose it. At every turn, Jesus the king 
proves himself more powerful than the earthly kings. Now in verse 25, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem where they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Now the scene shifts. From this point forward in chapter 13, the center location is Antioch of Syria. Don't get confused. There's two Antiochs. The Antioch we mention now is the Antioch that we studied at length in Acts chapter 11. This particular Antioch lay at the northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea, an important city of some half a million people, multicultural in every sense, lots of different religions dominated by pagan influence. It was the place where Gentiles were evangelized first, probably even before Peter himself got permission to speak to the household of Cornelius. But Antioch itself lay up the river, the Orontes River, and it was not just exactly on the sea. And so although Antioch was an important city, you had to get on a little boat, go up the Oron down the Orontes River to reach some 25 kilometers to the Mediterranean Sea. So very much a coastal city in a sense, but it was not right on the coast. If you bought coastal property in Antioch of Syria, you probably didn't get your money's worth. Okay, it was down the river a little bit, and that's the way that you would get into the Mediterranean Sea. But by being upriver, it also unlocked other places that you could go to transport your goods. So Antioch is where we find ourselves now. And Antioch is going to be, I think, a great tool for us to better understand how the church grew in the first century and I think it will help us unlock principles so that we, as the body of Christ in the 21st century, might understand how to grow. There's not a 10 principles for growth in the 21st century by the Apostle Paul outlined like this. What people connect with, what we connect with, are stories. But within the stories, if we begin to ask those questions... The principles become abundantly clear that there were principles that the early church were putting into practice that led to statements like, and the word of God spread. How did it spread? How did it grow? We're going to learn those things as we begin to study. One of the things that we learn as the word of God spreads the principles that Jesus shared about the kingdom of God within the Gospels hold true. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Is a mustard seed large or small? It's very small. But a mustard seed, when it grows, grows significantly. But one of the things that's often missed is that the mustard tree was not a desirable tree in the first century. Mark, how many times have you intentionally planted mesquite on land that you owned? Happy a zero. Okay. Why a zero? Because mesquite grows uninhibited and takes over everything else. If you go to clear out some mesquite, have you ever <coughs> driven by? The last time I remember this is uh, going through Wichita Falls recently. There's area of land that they're clearing out from mesquite. Of course, mesquite is non-native to Texas. It was brought here on the hooves of cattle on cattle drives from uh, places south up to Amarillo. Way too much history this morning. I am so sorry. But the non-native mesquite now appears to be the tree of Texas. When you go to take out some mesquite, it's larger under the grounds than it is on top of the ground. And I see some of you breaking out into a cold sweat just thinking about it because you've uprooted mesquite before. And it's incredibly difficult to get rid of it. Jesus, modern day Texas interpretation, the kingdom of heaven is like the seed of a mesquite tree. 
It appears small, and then it grows. Why does that complete the picture a little bit? Because we would understand that it's not a tree that everyone desires. When it grows and begins to branch out, people try to oppose it. And so the underlying principle from the kingdom of God being like a mustard seed is that it would have been something that when the world saw it, <coughs> they would have attempted to uproot it and get rid of it. As you see the kingdom of God begin to spread, a small seed that grows significantly at every turn we will find within the book of Acts, what? Opposition. This would not have been shocking to those who had internalized the parables of the kingdom of God because they understood that as small as that mustard seed is and it begins to grow, there's going to be opposition at every turn. We find that as the gospel begins to go out. In verse 1 of Acts chapter 13. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Prophets and teachers. Bold declaration. Prophecy. Not necessarily always foretelling the future, but also forth telling. You see this in the ministry of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and the prophets of old, that they would sometimes predict that certain things would happen. And one thing that's true about a Holy Spirit-inspired miraculous prophet is that if they are truly inspired, everything that they say will happen in the future will always take place. That's the test of a prophet that you find in Deuteronomy. A miraculously inspired prophet, if they say something will come to pass, it must come to pass. If it does not, they are not of the Lord. Keep that in mind for all present day folks who proclaim to be such. But we have to understand that within Scripture there was also a forth telling. That is a bold declaration of the action that you need to get behind. This is what you need to do. This is what you are meant to do. Now go and do it. And teachers, those who would instruct, those who would help the kingdom of God better understand their role, their mission, and better understand the word of God. Keep in mind that the church at Antioch, could they say, please turn with me to Acts chapter 13? No, they were living out Acts chapter 13. They did not have before him the word of God. They might eventually have had a copy of Mark and then a copy of Matthew and then gradually compiled the completed word of God. But as this is moving forward, you needed Holy Spirit miraculously inspired prophets and teachers and a balance of such. Now within this list, Luke gives, Luke writing Acts, the specific names. Barnabas, Simeon who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Five names. Lists of names are often given in order of importance. Here the name Saul is used as the last in the list. You'll find that as Acts moves forward, you have Barnabas and Saul, then Barnabas and Paul, and then Paul and Barnabas. Lists of names in ancient time were often given in order of importance. And I believe that it's worthy of note that Saul's name was at the last here as they began. We'll come back to this list later. I want you to ask the question, why are we given this list of five names? Why should we care about these men? Why does Luke take the time to give us the specific names of all five of these prophets and teachers? Some of them could have been both. Some of them could have been just 
a prophet. Some of them could have been just a teacher. Why does he give this list? While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. What did the church at Antioch find themselves doing? Worshiping. This is the only time this particular Greek word that is translated here, worship, is used. There are other Greek words that are translated worship. But specifically here, the idea is that they were together and that they were lifting up their voices together to the Lord. And they were fasting. Fasting is not something that you find often throughout the books, book of Acts, but it is something that is mentioned in the book of Acts. What is fasting? Fasting is to deny yourself of a non-sinful behavior in order to make serious your proclamation to the Lord. Fasting is denying yourself of a non-sinful behavior, most often food within the first century, in order to make serious your proclamation or your request to the Lord. Most specifically, fasting is found in Scripture as it pertains to food. To abstain from food, so much so that you go without it, for a time period that you would notice you were going out away from it. And then you would use that time to make a very serious proclamation to the Lord. Fasting is often done in Scripture together. The body of Christ. And this is what they were doing. Making serious their proclamation to the Lord at the church in Antioch. They were doing this. Now I say from a non-sinful behavior, around this time of the year, people feel obligated every once in a while to tell me of some thing they're going to give up for a particular time of the year. I've had several people tell me, not of this group, but hey, I'm, I'm going to fast from this. Like, it's not fasting if it's wrong. <laughs> That's called behavior transformation. I'm going to stop cussing for Lent. Congratulations. But let's go ahead and, and let's just make that a habit, right? To abstain from that. And so it's abstaining. Fasting is from a non-sinful behavior. So you might go on a social media fast. <coughs> well, it depends how you're using it, whether that's a non-sinful behavior or not. You might go for a while without a particular type of food. Maybe you're in a situation where you have to have food or a medical condition prescribes you to have that. We're not saying in this situation that if you never fast, you're doing it wrong. But I think every one of us, as we consider the importance with which the Holy Spirit takes to let us know what they were doing, might consider doing this on our own in some form or fashion and might consider this as an activity that we engage in together a little bit more often. Luke clearly describes this is what they were doing, and as they were participating in this together, they hear a very clear word from the Lord that it's Barnabas and Saul who need to go for the work that they have called them. What do they do next? Fasting and prayer. So what were they doing? Worshiping and fasting. And then they hear the word of the Lord. They're like, okay, great, let's go. Nope. What do they do again? Fasting and prayer. And then they laid their hands on them and sent them off. This is an instructive example for us. That not every time hands were laid on someone, is it a miraculous impartation of a gift? You will see if we go back to Acts chapter 8 that there are times when the apostles laid their hands on people in order to impart a miraculous gift. These men already had that ability. But hands were laid upon them as a recognition of we are setting you apart for a specific work. 
And so that was an acknowledgement that they were now going forth from that place and they had the blessing of the church at Antioch and they had been set apart for this specific work. So it is not something that is always a miraculous impartation of a gift. But it's an acknowledgement of, Lord, may you bless this person for this specific purpose. It is something that my question that I asked about this, is it something that would be helpful to do a little bit more often? Is it something that as we pray together for a very special purpose that we might be mindful of. There is something in the power of touch and in the power of giving encouragement one to another. I'm reminded in a similar fashion that when I prayed with my pop and grandma Fox, you were not allowed to hold your hands together. You always had to hold each other's hands at the table. Or as we left, we would have to gather around and hold hands. In a way, it was a reminder we are in this together. Granted, she was sending me off with cookies to another week of school at UC Davis. But I remember that very special and intimate touch of my grandfather and my grandmother. And so maybe it is that we look at scripture and say, what a special time, what a special awareness these people had of their community together and the Lord's way of assisting that work. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. You will notice that in the Acts of the Apostles, a reminder that this could also be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. At every turn, Luke is reminding us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, the church sent them out, but the church listened to the guidance of the Spirit. And then the church prayed, and then the church fasted, and as the church at Antioch sent them out, Luke records that this was done according to the work of the Spirit. Be reminded, brothers and sisters, that every work that we engage in as the church, as the kingdom of God, as we engage within it according to His Word, in obedience to His Word, and for His glory, that it is not our work by ourselves. We are working with divine guidance and with divine power. Granted, we will not hear an audible voice from the Spirit as the church at Antioch did, but it is no less powerful when we send men and women out from among us to preach the good news. They are guided by the Spirit and have angels behind them. And that is the very powerful work of the kingdom of God that we are engaged in from this place. They sailed to Cyprus. So they had to go down the river first. And then, depending on the time of the year, they might have had favorable winds. And there they got to Cyprus. Why Cyprus? Do you remember who was from Cyprus? Barnabas. Barnabas had owned land in Cyprus that he had sold. And so Cyprus was probably a place that Barnabas had contacts, connections, places they could stay. And it would have been a fertile ground. We also know that men from Cyprus had come to Antioch to preach the gospel to Gentiles. It would have been a place where there might have been some built-in opportunities already there. So Barnabas and Saul sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, could be pronounced Salamis, but I'm going to say probably not. They proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, 
and they had John to assist them. This is John Mark, who would, of course, later depart. But John Mark was there to assist them. This is on the northeastern side of Cyprus. It's as beautiful as the pictures look. It's an island. It's a place of importance. It's a place of beauty. And it was a place that had both Jew and Gentile. And the pattern of Barnabas and Saul would be to deliver the message to Jews and then to Gentiles. And you find this at every turn, although Paul was going to be an apostle to the Gentiles, he shared the message with Jews in every community. And typically, the synagogue was the place that they went first. They would find men and women of Jewish background. Why? Because it was the Israelites who should have understood the fulfillment of the promise of the Messiah who was to come in Jesus Christ as the one who was going to come and take away the sins of the world. And as the Jews hopefully accepted that, then it would found a foundation from which to teach to the Gentiles. We know how this typically went, though, don't we? Now, in this particular place, we don't read about rejection first. We'll find that later. But I think it's important to remember this pattern that these men had as they approached a new city. They found the people who ought to have been familiar with the promises of God, and they shared the gospel with them. And then they began from that point to share the message with the entirety of the community. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician. Be thankful for the concise nature of the book of Acts. There's detail, but they don't tell us everything that happens at every turn. They start on the eastmost point of the island, and then they work their way down all the way to the western side, to the most important city of the island, where the most important person of the island lived as he was appointed by the emperor of Rome. That's right, the governor or proconsul of this senatorial region was appointed by the emperor of Rome and Barnabas, Saul, John Mark, and any others who would have been traveling with them went from synagogue to synagogue and they worked their way all to the westmost point of the island and here they found someone willing to try to uproot the mustard tree. The kingdom of God was spreading in Cyprus. And here the opposition becomes very clear. In Exodus chapter 7, it says in verse 1, And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt. And bring my host, my people, the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt in great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. The signs and wonders that accompanied Moses and Aaron were referred to by the writer of Exodus as the mighty hand of the Lord upon the Egyptians. When the Egyptians and Pharaoh himself opposed Moses and Aaron who were proclaiming the direct word of God along with signs that they were able to perform, it was recorded that the hand of the Lord was upon the opposition of those who were spreading the word of the Lord. It says in verse 6, 
when they had gone through the whole island as far as, far as Paphos, they came across a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. There's a lot going on there with just his name. So he was a magician. You could see him as a spiritual consultant. That's what he would be called in our present day. He was a spiritual consultant to the most important person on the island. Although he was Jewish in background, he consulted the dark arts in order to advise the most important person on the island on his daily activities. I don't know what he had in order to pull the wool over his eyes, but his name was Bar-Jesus, literally meaning son of Yeshua. That's right, son of Jesus. That was his name. He was also called Elamis. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of the Lord. Sergius Paulus, the most important person on the island, is recorded by Luke as being what? An intelligent man with an open heart. News had probably traveled of all that Barnabas and Saul were doing. And he asked them for an audience. Now if he is asking two traveling itinerant preachers to come into his court to give him a message, how do you think the local magician would feel? Threatened, obviously. Look at what they've accomplished on the islands and listen to what they're proclaiming. And he probably would have been aware that the signs that accompanied them were true signs. It's not the first time We've seen someone who practiced the dark arts come into opposition. Remember back to Acts chapter 8. Remember Simon the sorcerer in Samaria. Now we find Elamis, known also as Bar-Jesus. It says in verse 8, But Elamis, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. When the word of God goes out, it will always encounter opposition, difficulty, problems, and confrontation. Opposition, difficulty, problems, and confrontation. As Jonathan quoted last week, if you don't find the devil opposing you, maybe it is that you're running the same direction. When you find opposition, the great irony that I've found in my own life and maybe in yours, we see opposition sometimes and say, oh, I can't believe this is happening to me. Maybe if we find true opposition when we are transformed by the word of the Lord, it is confirmation that we are really living it out. And we should not say, oh, woe is me, but instead, thank you, Lord, for granting me the opportunity to suffer for your name because I know whenever the kingdom of God spread in the first century, they found opposition, difficulties, problems, and confrontation. And so may it be, Lord, grant me the strength and bring it on, Satan. I'm ready because I know who is behind me and I know who goes before me. And when we find opposition, difficulties, problems, confrontation, we say in prayer, faith, and trust, I will continue to walk with the Lord. Prayer, faith, trust. Whenever we face the same things that Barnabas and Saul faced. Here comes Elamis opposing the proconsul and trying to take him away from what? Away from the faith. That's the description of this. But Saul, and now we find for the first time, who was also called Paul. Scripture doesn't give a lot of description as to why Paul, amongst the Gentiles, now on his first missionary journey, and no longer Saul. Saul was a name that would have been well known throughout Jewish synagogues. And of course, Saul 
of the tribe of Benjamin that would have been familial for Saul. Saulus was a Greek word that referred to an effeminate way of walking in the first century. You would have been known as a Saulus if you walked a certain way. And it was not a compliment. Most scholars say that the change of name would have been something that would have taken away a potential distraction that his name could have conjured up in Gentile communities. Is it really that simple? Quite possibly. Quite possibly. And it's interesting, although Scripture never says why. But Saulus meant something different the further from Jerusalem that you got. And so Saul, we read here, was known as Paul. Filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. Oh, this gaze, you've probably seen it before. Paul isn't messing around. Paul looks intently at Elamis, who's trying to take people away from the faith, and these are the words that he directs at him. Listen here, buddy. You've got some changing to... No. Look at what he says. It's incredible. You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Now before you go tell the person that you think is your enemy on Facebook exactly what you think about them, according to Acts 13 and verse 10, remember that Paul is inspired by the Holy Spirit and he has seen the dark arts prevalent before him and this man is intentionally trying to pull someone away from the faith. Paul always gives credit where credit is due. Scripture says about Paul that he was guided by the Holy Spirit. And if this man, Elamis, was trying to take somebody away from the faith, then who is it that Elamis has given himself over to? Nothing less than the devil himself. And he is no son of righteousness. In fact, he is an enemy of all righteousness. He's full of deceit and villainy. When you decide to give your life over to sin, when you quit, when you give up, when you say, I'm going to oppose the Lord, keep in mind that it's not just about you. You are giving yourself over to someone else to serve. You will always serve someone. You will always be a slave to something. May we be servants of the Lord and slaves of righteousness. If we are not, we are sons of the devil and slaves to sin. There is no middle ground. And so Paul calls it what it is, abundantly clear, so that Sergius Paulus, who had an open and honest heart, could understand really what was going on. Imagine the intensity of this confrontation. A public confrontation, no doubt. Amongst the other magistrates, amongst the other servants, amongst the many who were listening. And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. Your Bible has a Blue glowing hyperlink to what? Exodus chapter 7. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. Where had Paul heard that phrase before? As Moses and Aaron went to perform signs and share the message of God, and opposition came at them in the largest court of the land. And here now, Paul and Barnabas in a significant court setting, being opposed by a magician, 
And he says, the hand of the Lord is upon you. Not in a way of, oh, that's a blessing. But in the same way that the hand of the Lord was upon the Egyptians as they opposed the kingdom of Israel. You will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. The one who was trying to lead others away from the faith now immediately had to ask for someone else to lead him by the hand. The irony would not have been lost in this setting. Paul himself, though, had experienced blindness. I would like to say that although this is a very quick and specific act of judgment upon this man, that Scripture does not say it was going to be a forever blindness, and Scripture doesn't say, really, what happens to him after this. I would like to think that there was an opportunity for repentance. But like any good writer, we are left by the writer to simply ask the question and wonder. Then the proconsul believed. Sergius Paulus. Then he believed. Remember as we see the word believe in Scripture? That it's not a simple mental assent to a set of principles. Belief is trusting faith that's put into action. As he believed, it says, when he saw what had occurred, now this is interesting, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Verse 12 is extremely helpful as we go from place to place with Saul and Barnabas and encounter their miracles. He believed as he witnessed what had took place because he was astonished at what? The teaching of the Lord. The miracles confirmed the what? The message. Remember, these men perform miracles from place to place to give confirmation to the message. If you're waiting for a miracle today, be reminded, however amazing anything that might happen to you is, it's always intended to be a confirmation of the message. The message, the Word of God, transforms hearts, minds, and spirits. The teaching of the Lord is what ultimately he was amazed at. The reason he was amazed about it, though, the complete picture, is that he saw that these men truly had a divine power that confirmed a divine message. And so now his life was going to be changed. The most important person on the island. What an incredible first story in the first missionary journey of Barnabas and Saul. And now it begins to be Paul and Barnabas. You'll find in Acts chapter 13. We're not going to complete... Acts chapter 13 this morning and a great sigh of relief went over the audience. We are going to focus on a few practical principles that we can learn from the church in Antioch. The church in Antioch, that's right. Chapter 13 and 14, although they may be about Paul's first missionary journey, are intended to be seen in Scripture as the extension of the church in Antioch. Notice that as we began chapter 13, 
It says, now there were in the church, and it says in verse 2, they were worshiping, and then they laid their hands on them. As you return to Antioch in Acts chapter 14, this is the bookmark, or the book end, excuse me, of the first missionary journey. Notice in verse 27. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, this is after they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commanded to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. When they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them. And then verse 28, and they remained no little time with the disciples. So chapters 13 and 14, you could say it's the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas empowered by the Holy Spirit. You could also say Acts chapter 13 and 14, the work of the church in Antioch. You could say the work in San Rafael del Sur with Brother Edgardo Torres, the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of the church in Midland, Texas. You could see as the church sends people out that they are active participants in that evangelistic work together. Notice a few things about the church in Antioch that we can implement today. Notice that they were listeners and learners. We find back in Acts chapter 11 that Paul and Barnabas met with the church often in Antioch as they studied the word of God together. And then as we open Acts chapter 13, there were prophets and teachers that were named very specifically. What did the church at Antioch do often? They learned and they listened. When they heard a very specific word from the Holy Spirit, what does it say they did? exactly what they were told. A church that will be empowered by God's Spirit will be a church that is actively learning and actively listening. And as we learn and as we listen, that means we implement what's being accomplished. The church in Antioch were listeners and they were learners. They also had a spirit of generosity. In Acts chapter 11, what did we find the church at Antioch did? Upon hearing the word of Agabus, a prophet, grasshopper, as you remember, who came and said there was going to be a great famine, what did the church at Antioch do? They provided a gift for the church in Judea. Immediately. That was it. They heard the word of the Lord through Agabus, and they said, absolutely. We will give towards that work. They were a church of some means, and their brothers in Judea were going to be suffering, and so they generously gave. You might also note that they generously gave of their talents as well. Do you think somebody might have been sitting there when they said, and Saul and Barnabas need to go on a missionary journey, and they looked at each other and said, hey, what about us? We liked having Saul and Barnabas around. <laughs> They know a lot of stuff, and, and they've been really good to us, and they've been here a long time. And what are we going to do without them? I mean, what's going to happen to them? That would have been a natural response. But the church in Antioch not only gave of their financial abundance, but they also gave of their talents. They sent out their talents. And they brought them back, and then they sent them out again. They were listeners and learners, and they were generous in their spirit with their finances and with their talents. They were also a multicultural community. I asked you why the list of names. This list of names is diverse in a couple of ways. First, You'll find Barnabas, the 
brethren in Jerusalem would have said that Barnabas was loaded. He had money. That was before he sold all his land and gave everything to the church. Barnabas was a man of means. Barnabas knew how to interact with people of different social standing. Barnabas is listed amongst the names in Acts chapter 13. Simeon, who is called Niger. Simeon, who is called Niger, that refers to the dark complexion of his skin. Not in a pejorative sense in any way. But it is to let us know that he's from a different ethnic background, perhaps than Barnabas and others. Then, listed next, Lucius of Cyrene. Lucius of Cyrene. Where's Cyrene? That's on the northmost point of Africa. From a different location, all of a sudden we're beginning to look at this list and say, all prophets and teachers, all in the church in Antioch, Cyprus, one known as Niger, one from Cyrene, and then, most interestingly, I think, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. The actual word that's used there could mean an adopted family member of Herod the Tetrarch. If you were a Herod, remember this was a, a name of a Jewish ruler, you would not allow your children to just play with anyone on the street. You would adopt people into your family of the same age as your kids so they had someone to play with. And so this is often how this word was used in ancient culture. It has a broad sense of meaning, but Luke lets us know that one of the men on the list grew up in the palace of Herod the Tetrarch and was familial in relationship with him. Niger, Cyrene, Barnabas from the island, Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, a Jew of the Jews, right? As Saul would say of himself, yet commissioned to go amongst the Gentiles. As you read this list, remember, Antioch was the first place that Gentiles received the message as it's recorded. It was a multicultural community that embodied what it looked like and what it meant to be the body of Christ without borders, without worry about what nationality or what language or what cultural practice. They were from all over the place. They all looked different and they were all partners together in the body of Christ because they were listeners and learners and they were dedicated to the cause of Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful picture and it is a picture that this scripture is painting. I see that embodied here. I see it embodied in the church in Odessa. I see it in many different places. And there is value in different social and economic standing and in different diverse cultural backgrounds and not valuing one over another. The gospel is from the small to the great, from the rich and the poor, without concern about where one comes from. United for the cause of Jesus Christ. We must take this description very seriously and realize that it is one of the reasons the church was impactful first from Antioch. And a fourth and last consideration is that the church in Antioch was dedicated to living out spiritual discipline, or as I call them, tools for transformation. We don't pray just to pray. We don't fast just to fast. We don't give just to give. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, if we pray just so others can see us, that's your reward. If we fast just so that we can tell people on Facebook, I'm hungry for the Lord, then we've received our reward in full. 
like. But if we fast for the Lord together, if we pray fervently together for the work of the Lord, that is the seedbed for the work of the Spirit. That is the seedbed so that the Lord can water the seed and grant the increase. We, together, just as the church in Antioch, must be disciplined in our own individual activities and then together as the body of Christ to pray, fast, and give, not simply so that we can say we've done it, but as an empowering work of the Lord. Honoring Him. It is about Him. And that is why the church from Antioch became so powerful in the spread of the gospel. They appointed these faithful men in obedience to the Holy Spirit. And the work went out and it didn't matter who opposed them. The work of the Lord spread. They listened, they learned. They were generous. They didn't look at each other for what was on the outside or where they came from. And they were dedicated to giving, to prayer, and to fasting just as Jesus commanded. The message is yours. And I hope that there are active principles that we can apply from these verses in the book of Acts. I hope that we will realize and take very seriously the message that Paul sent as he preached to Sergius Paulus and in his court. As he called out Elamus, we need to remember, we have a choice. Do we, have, do we live as a son of the one who is doomed to destruction? Or are we living as a child of the one who is truly the king? How do you live as a child of one who is truly the king? Mark 16 and 16, the good news of Jesus Christ is those that believe and are baptized will be saved. As the apostles went out and preached the good news to all creation in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, they were told to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always to the very ends. He was going to be with them as they preached this message of obedience. May we ever live faithfully to him. And if we see that Satan is making inroads in our life, call it for what it is. Leave it behind. Don't let it drag you back in the places you used to be, but rather live honorably and faithfully to the one who died for your sins. The message is yours this morning. Please come as we stand and as we sing together. We're going to sing number three.